Good morning. That was the warning shot. Here comes the second one. Good morning. I know some of you are not done visiting, but I'm going to give you another minute in just a little bit, okay? All right, just so you know. It is good to see you today, and uh, glad that we could worship together this morning. Uh, kind of turned off a little bit springy again, but, uh, but we'll take that. A um, couple of announcements to, to call to your attention this morning. First of all, this evening uh, is our monthly Grow Meal. So we we'll hope that you will come and be a part of that and get a chance to uh, visit with some folks from the community and a uh, good outreach opportunity. That's tonight at 6 o'clock. <coughs> About that. Uh, for those of you who are on the church council, church council will meet tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock in our usual location. So be aware of that. Uh, also, um, our back-to-school fair I mean, it, it's a little ways out, but it'll be here before you know it. So we're going to begin collecting items, and we're going to be collecting some different things through the course of the summer. So you're going to want to continue to watch for this. Uh, right now, we're collecting some specific personal care items, specifically uh, shampoo and either body wash or, or bar soap are the items we're collecting for the first uh, couple, three weeks. There is a little kitty swimming pool out in the foyer by the offices. It's uh, set up exactly for that. So if you would contribute uh, to, to that, uh, you can just drop those in there over the course of the next couple of weeks. Uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with the back to school fair, this is something that has uh, that has grown over the course of the few years. But uh, uh, in August, uh, shortly before the back to school time, uh, we supply kids who are in need with uh, they're needed uh, school supplies as well as uh, some of these personal care types of items. Uh, they have an opportunity to, to come and get uh, eye screenings, ear screenings, a dental check, a free haircut. We feed them lunch. And, uh, and we also have a program through which they can get a, a, a new pair of shoes uh, and a great uh, uh, kind of ministry and, and outreach opportunity for us. And, of course, we have a lot of people who partner with us. So we'll be collecting for that through the summer, so be aware of that particular one. Um, you may notice today there are a, a smattering of people in yellow shirts scattered around the sanctuary. Uh, uh, today is National Disaster Relief Appreciation Day, and, and we're going we're gonna to talk a little more about that in just a few moments. Uh, but for now, uh, I'm going to let you finish greeting somebody you haven't spoken to yet today, but do it a little quickly because then Gary's going to come and lead us and we're going to worship in song. So let's stand together. Find somebody you haven't spoken to yet today and greet him in the name of the Lord.
Let's be standing and let's start our first song this morning with Happiness is the Lord. Happiness is to know the Savior living alive within his favor, having a change in my behavior. Happiness is the Lord. Happiness is a new creation, Jesus and me, in close relation, having a part in his salvation. Happiness is the Lord. Real joy is mine, no matter if teardrops start, I found the secret. And Jesus in my heart. Happiness is to be forgiven, living a life that is worth living, taking a trip that leads to heaven. Happiness is the Lord. As the deer. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long. To worship thee. You alone shake my shield, and you alone made my spirit yield. You alone are my heart, desire, and I long to worship thee. You're my friend, and you are my brother, even though you are a king. I love you more than any other, so much more than anything. You alone are my strength, my shield, to you. I want you more, for silver only you can satisfy. You am the apple of my heart. You alone are my strength, my shield. You alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my mother, and I long to worship thee. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this beautiful day that you have given to us. The opportunity we have to come and to rejoice, not only in the day, but to rejoice in you and to rejoice in your presence, to rejoice in the fellowship that we have with, with your people, uh, united together by the, 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 the common core of our faith and trust in the work of Christ on the cross and the salvation that he brings to us. Lord, we, we come today to express our love for you. But we can do so, Lord, only as we celebrate the incredible love that you have shown to us and taught to us. Lord, as we come today, we, we, we come living in a troubled times in a troubled world. And, 
And as such, Lord, we, we, we need your intervention in our lives and in the world around us. We come, Lord, uh, searching and desiring for, for your presence and for your work and for your peace and strength to overwhelm our hearts as well as the world in, in which we live. And so, Lord, we just pray that as we come today, that we would come setting aside anything uh, of our own agenda that might uh, compete for our attention or might compete for, for what you desire to say to us and to do in us today. And Lord, just we, we want you to have your way within us, within our hearts and within our fellowship this morning. We, we pray that when we go from this place, we would go knowing that we've been in your presence, knowing that we have heard from you and knowing that our lives are changed for the better because we were and, and that we're prepared for whatever life may hold in store because we had this opportunity to worship together in your presence today. Lord, just have your way among us and be honored and glorified by all that we do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Missouri Baptist Disaster Relief Team members, thank you for serving the Lord through this vital ministry. I'm so grateful to the Lord for your readiness, your response, and recovery efforts on behalf of other people. Your work, your sacrifice, and your service shine the gospel light in so many dark places. Thank you for sharing your time and skills in past events, and thanks for your readiness to serve when the next crisis strikes. As Missouri Baptist, we all seek to transform lives and communities with the gospel, and you help us accomplish this by bringing help and hope and healing when and where it is needed the most. May the Lord richly bless you in the days ahead. Thank you for your service. I'm going to say a couple of words about disaster relief, uh, if I may, this morning. Um, this is a word of, of, of personal experience. You know, I, I, I grew up around blue-collar, handy people. I worked my way through school doing construction work and a lot of remodeling kind of stuff and really didn't have any idea how that might be useful to me further in life as God had called me into ministry. Um, I had my first personal experience with disaster relief back in, I've forgotten what year it was, but it was 18 months after Hurricane Katrina. I was at another church at the time. We took a team down to do some rebuilding work at that time uh, after that. And um, that was a little different experience than a lot of the disaster relief work that we do now. But, 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 I, but I really fell in love with it. And when I came here, uh, this church, we had been involved in some disaster relief work in the past. That was kind of, that was kind of tailing out. Uh, although shortly after I came, we did send a chainsaw team to do some work in Joplin after the tornado, and then, and then we really didn't have uh, any any involvement in disaster relief that I'm aware of for for five or six years, um, until Hurricane uh, uh, Harvey hit. It was Harvey, right? Harvey hit Houston, Texas, in uh, in 2017, and uh, five of us got in the church van and threw what tools we could in the back of the van and drove to Houston, Texas, working not working, working with our sister organization, uh, uh, North America Mission Board Send Relief, and did some flood recovery work. Um, and, you know, sometimes God works in really interesting and mysterious ways. And I love to tell this story because, uh, you know, the five of us had, had gone, and while we were in Houston, Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, um, and and I and I and I had an epiphany. Uh, on that Saturday, I had five of us as a captive audience in a van for twelve hours, and we hadn't left Houston before I said, well, "What do y'all think about going and doing some work in Puerto Rico?" And the first response was, "I I don't." But by the time we got home, I had at least a couple saying, you know, 
maybe we shouldn't go to Puerto Rico. And as you all know, you know, nine months later, we took a team of nine folks to Puerto Rico, did some rebuilding work. We got started from there, kind of back into the Missouri Baptist and Southern Baptist disaster relief work. We took a bunch of people to get trained that next year. And uh, does everybody know the story of the trailer? I'm going to tell it because I love to tell it, and I've got the pulpit. Um, we, we, we went uh, that next fall to, to North Carolina, responding to flood recovery after Hurricane Florence. And it was, again, a handful of us in the church van with tools thrown in the back. And it was there that, that we kind of decided, you know, we need to go back and bring to the church to make this a more official ministry and to begin the process of raising some funds to purchase and equip a trailer to actually be able to do this because we feel like the Lord is leading us in this ministry and he seems to be blessing us in this ministry. So we need to pursue that. We came back in the December business meeting. Uh, this would have been 2018. Um, we brought to, to the church and we voted to officially make disaster relief part of our ministry. We set a disaster relief coordinator at the time and we officially established a fund to purchase and equip a trailer. That was the third week in December. Sometime in the night on Christmas Eve of that year, some blessed anonymous person parked a trailer on our lot and put an envelope in our mailbox with a deed and a bill of sale and a bunch of other stuff and a note that said, I heard you were looking for a disaster relief trailer. I hope this will do. By the way, it was bigger than the trailer that we were thinking about purchasing because God knew what we needed, and and praise God. If we needed a confirmation at that point, we, we, we had it. And from there, it's just, it's just uh, been an incredible ministry. At this point, some of the favorite times that I spend, some of my favorite things to do are deploying on disaster relief. I, I love the folks that, that work with disaster relief here, and we have an incredible time. I've never known a group of people that could laugh so hard when you're standing on the side of the road because you've run out of gas for the second time in 15 minutes. That's a whole story. If you haven't heard it, ask me. I'd be glad to tell you. They're, they're, they're great folks. But in addition to just being great folks, I have seen all of us grow spiritually through involvement in disaster relief. It is a blessing on our end, on top of the fact that it is an incredibly moving blessing to be able to be a, a blessing and to encourage uh, homeowners who, who you are, are helping after disaster types of, of, uh, of uh, situations. On top of that, we are there to be able to help support the ministry of the local church. I mean, we come in in mass for a few weeks to do a lot of work, but in doing so, we make a lot of connections that then those local churches can follow up on. And we get the opportunity of, of seeing a number of people come to Christ during disaster relief. But there are many, many more who come to faith or who renew their faith uh, after we leave because Southern Baptists came in in mass and, and did incredible work. Now, over the course of these last few years, we have had people, and I, I hope I'm not going to miss something, and if I do, what do you all tell me? We've, we, we've had people involved. Our original involvement was in, was in mud out or flood recovery work. Uh, we got trained, and we have done uh, several deployments for chainsaw work, including most recently after the tornadoes in Kentucky uh, last fall. Uh, we have had a group of guys who with barely set foot in their own kitchen, worked for a week in the mass feeding and worked in the kitchen in Lafayette, Louisiana. That was a lot of fun, but, but those women worked too hard. <laughs> uh, we've, we've had folks deploy with our shower units. For the first time, we sent a group last summer to Colorado to do ash out work. Uh, we've, we've done some, some child care types of work. I've got another story I can tell you there. Um, what have I forgotten? What have I left something out? What else have we done? Sandbagging. We've done sandbagging ahead of flooding. That's yeah. That's that's true. Did I forget something else. Just just uh, one of the things that I have discovered with our disaster relief folks here is that having gotten involved and having under begin to understand and experience the blessing of being a blessing to people in disaster responses is that once they got a taste of that, they will be willing to do just about anything that we're asked to do. 
uh, if, uh, if if someone will just point and say go there. Now I said that. Let, let me tell my child care story. I, I last year when when the tornadoes hit Kentucky, I called our state director Galen Moss and told him. I said, I mean, and he knows our team. He knows Eldorado Springs team. You can count on those guys to do whatever is needed to be done. Whatever they need to do, we'll we'll we'll, we'll step in and do it. And so I called him and said, listen, we I got I got a team ready to go. We'll do whatever. He said, this deployment is a little different. It's been a little strange, just kind of how everything has worked. So I can't tell you for sure what you're going to do, but we definitely have work for you to do. Come on. So we hit it up and, and, and went to Princeton, Kentucky. We walked in. It was late evening, and I walked into the incident command center in this, in this church where we were being housed, and they, kept, they were beginning to talk about where they were going to send us the next day, and they kept talking about daycare, the daycare the daycare. And I didn't say it out loud at that moment, but I'm thinking in the back of my mind, now I know I said we would do anything, but you may be taking on a liability that you don't realize if you're going to put us in charge. What I realized was they were talking about a daycare building that had been utterly destroyed where they were doing a lot of work, and I was greatly relieved when I found that out. But um, I know we said we'd do anything, but anyway. Um, I, I could go on, and I and I I, I won't take a lot of, you know, more time talking about that. But I want to take a moment to to recognize our disaster relief folks. So I'm going to do this in two stages. First of all, if you have deployed with disaster relief in the last 12 months, in other words, that would go back to Colorado ash out. If if you have deployed since then in the last 12 months, would you stand? Let, let us recognize you. We got folks in the sound system back here. Jim, y'all can be seated. Jim Bridgewater you, you deployed with us. Hasn't been through training yet, but deployed with us for the first time in Kentucky. And uh, uh, kind of baptism by fire. We threw you in the deep end there a little bit, didn't we? <laughs> but uh, so glad that you did. Now, I'd like to, because I know we've got folks who haven't deployed in the last year, but have deployed on disaster relief or who have been trained and are prepared for that. So if you have deployed ever once, or if you have been trained in disaster relief, can, would you stand? Let us recognize all of you, all of our folks. Come on. Yeah. You've gone through training. I know. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this day is set aside nationally by Southern Baptists to basically just do that, to, to say thank you. Because sometimes sometimes that work can become thankless, thankless work. Uh, but I don't want that to be the case with our church. And one of the things that I want you to recognize, even if you haven't or can't or won't deploy, this is your ministry as a church. Uh, our disaster relief, I mean, your, your support helps to support the disaster relief uh, ministry here. Uh, we, we need your prayers. You know, anytime that we are, are, are deploying or are deployed, I always make a point, and, and these folks don't always know it because I don't always talk about it, but I always make a point every time we deploy to enlist somebody who will be in prayer for each one who goes and their families who are left behind. And I do that for a kind of selfish reason because the first several times that we deployed, some disaster happened at my house while I was gone. Hot water heater went out one year. One year somebody hit my mailbox and was laying in the middle of the road. One year a car broke down. I don't know. There was a whole lot more. And I decided, you know, we need folks praying for us, but we need folks praying for the family back home. So I want to thank those of you who have been a huge part of disaster relief through your prayers, generally for our disaster relief and specifically for those folks and for their families. I thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to take just a moment to, to, to say a prayer of thanks for our disaster relief ministry folks, and then we're going to continue to in, in our worship service this morning. But let us pray. Lord Jesus, I, I, I thank you so much that you have uh, given us the privilege and the favor uh, just to be able to be involved in disaster relief. Well, there was a time in which we looked and it seemed like a huge task. It was going to take a lot of funding and a lot of things that maybe we didn't have to, to really get involved in disaster relief. But, but you called us and, and led us in that direction, and then you just provided in overwhelming, miraculous ways, and we are so grateful. For that, we're, we're grateful that you have given us the stewardship of this ministry. We're grateful, Lord, for the blessing that we've been able to be to homeowners and to communities 
uh, this far in this ministry. And we're so thankful for the blessing that you have brought home to us in being involved in disaster relief ministry. Father, I just pray for, for these folks and for others who will come and be trained and get involved. We, we pray that, uh, that, that you would just supply for them every spiritual and physical need they need to do that. We pray as we deploy in the future, Lord, that you would protect us as you have protected us uh, and that you would use us as you would see fit, Father. We thank you for this ministry, but we recognize that it is yours. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to worship in song. Mary. When you be from you washed in the blood of the Lamb, when you fall trusting in the ground, are you trust in the ground of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion bright? Are you blood of the Lamb, are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. When you are evil, a victory win. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There in the precious blood of the Lamb, would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood. Fire in the blood, sin stains are lost in its life giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working. 
walking power and the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. When you live daily to praise us, to sing, there's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the land. And the power. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the land. We got a special coming up with our back. I'm glad we're glad to have Terry Harris back with us on the organ. His stent work had to go through his wrist instead of other places, and so he hadn't been able to use them his keyboard hands very good. But he's back at it now, thank and ready to go. Terry. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Good to have you back. Gary and I have been pushing this announcement back and forth to one another all morning, so I guess I'll make it. Okay. Unless you want to make it. Okay. Um, Golden Angels. Tuesday, June 14th. Uh, Golden Angels will be entertained by Joe Willis, the Lone Geezer. Am I reading this right? Okay. All right, just want to make sure he's from Nevada, Missouri. Uh, he has a home studio with the knowledge of music learned while majoring in music at the University of Missouri. Uh, performs just about anywhere 
good, clean family entertainment. Uh, your friends will enjoy his mix of cowboy and gospel music. Bring a covered dish. Have a good time. That's June 14th. Uh, so mark that on your calendar. Um, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I <clears throat> hope you do. I'm going to invite you to open them to the book of Second Peter, chapter 1. You know, the Lord does, again, things that I don't always understand until after the fact. And that was true this weekend. Um, I'm going to share with you one more kind of uh, announcement and prayer request here in a moment. And, and uh, I know we're running short on time, but in a way that's okay because, you know, I, I uh, took my Bible home over the weekend and last night I frantically tore my house apart looking for it and it's there somewhere and I don't know where it is, but wherever it is, it has my sermon notes in it. So, um, so a short message means that I have some extra time for some extra announcements. I, want, I, I do want you to be aware as you're turning to Second Peter this morning, uh, we've been talking a little bit for the last several weeks uh, about an upcoming missions opportunity, and I, we'll, we'll have this printed in the bulletin next week, uh, uh, but I, I, I want to mention it to you by way of a, of a prayer request now just so you know uh, what's happening. You get an opportunity to hear that. I can't remember what all I have told you, but... But uh, in, in June, uh, 11th to the 18th, we, we have a small team from our church uh, who is going to be joining a mission team from Double Springs, Mississippi uh, in, in doing some, some mission work with the First Baptist Church in Poplar, Montana. And Poplar, Montana happens to be the, the capital of the Fort Peck Indian Reservation, so we're, that's that's the ministry we're doing. Now, now we are going with a small team this year with the plan of getting involved in that as an ongoing mission opportunity over, over, over the long haul. When I first became aware of this mission opportunity, we, we realized that they were looking for people to come and help do vacation Bible school and to do some maintenance work. Well, I got all these disaster relief people and we do as good a vacation Bible school as I know of. So I'm like, that sounds like a great opportunity. Uh, I contacted Pastor Leto. Put him on your prayer list. P Pastor Leto. I can't pronounce his last name yet, so I'm not going to tell you. But Leto, L-I-T-O. Um, Pastor Leto is, is Filipino, but he is a North American Mission Board missionary. He's been pastoring this church um, uh, for, for the past six years. And, of course... Primarily, their ministry is to the Native Americans in the, in the area. The first question he asked me whenever I called him and talked to him about, about the possibility of coming and doing some work was, how much experience does your church have in doing cross-cultural ministry? Because he said, honestly, work with Native Americans is very much a cross-cultural ministry for white people. Uh, more than most people realize. He said, honestly, it ought to be handled by the International Mission Board, but because of its geographical location, it's not. How much experience do you have in cross-cultural ministry? I said, as a church, very little. And he said, then I'm going to strongly suggest that you connect with a team that has been coming for some time to come with them for the first time, to learn from them, something about doing cross-cultural gospel ministry in this area. And he said, that team and myself will kind of mentor you and teach you, and then you can take those folks home and teach your folks, and you'll be better prepared for when you come back and bring a full team. I said, that sounds great. Who's coming and when? He gave me a list. And anyway, long story short, I talked to Mike Bayham, who is the pastor and, and leader of this team from Double Tree, Mississippi. And so we are sending five people to join with 15 people from Double Tree, Mississippi, uh, to, to, to work with them, doing Bible school work, doing some maintenance kind of work, and then all, 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 other than that, doing whatever Pastor Leto points and says, would you please go do this for a week? Um, and, and I'm saying this for information, but but also so that you can get all of this on on your prayer list. Let me let me tell you who's who's actually going. Uh, the team will consist of myself, uh, Patty King, Ken Paradin, Elbert Biddlecombe, and and Debbie, uh, and we'll be going and 
our, our ultimate desire, our ultimate goal this time is to be any and every kind of help we can to the Double Springs team, but to learn from them and Pastor Lito what we need to know to be prepared to be able to go back in the future. So I hope that you'll be praying for for our trip, be praying for our team members. We'll have this information in the bulletin next week. Uh, be praying for Pastor Lito. Be praying for Mike as he leads the team. Be praying for uh, the, the 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 Lakota uh, peoples who uh, is I mean there's it's a lot more complicated than that, but those are the folks that we're going to be ministering to. Um, Anyway, put, put that on your prayer list, if you would. If you haven't found Second Peter by now, ask your neighbor to help you, because um, I gave you a lot of, gave you a lot of time. <laughs> um, I have discovered, in, in my experience at home, as kind of a do-it-yourselfer, that the success of any project that I do, I, I've learned to, um, to define that success by the number of trips that I have to make to the hardware store. You know, the less trips, the more successful the project. Some of you guys know, know what I'm talking about. Um, I, I think one of my favorite lines that I sometimes read on a package or on a set of instructions that I always take with a grain of salt is the phrase, all tools and materials supplied, some assembly required. Maybe, maybe not, right? Maybe, maybe not. It, it, we, I think, all know the frustration of trying to do any kind of a project, whether it's something around the house or whether it's something crafty or, or whatever it may be, and, and realizing partway through the project that there's something that you need but you don't have. And it's especially frustrating if you know that the thing that you don't have isn't something you can drive five minutes to the hardware store and pick up but rather it's a half a day trip to Springfield or to Joplin or a two day order on Amazon. It's frustrating to do a project and not have all of the supplies that you need. Well, the passage that I want to share with you this morning from Second Peter is, is a beautiful passage because it, it reminds us that as believers, our lives are a work in progress. A, a, a work that is a combined work between God and ourselves, with God being the primary worker and, and us being the helper, honestly. But, but the promise that Peter gives us here in 2 Peter is a promise that we can take to the bank that all tools and materials are supplied. Read with me, if you will, 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to begin with the first verse. It reads, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those through the righteousness of God, uh, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world that's caused by evil desires. We're going to pause right there. There's so much more we could look at in this passage, but there's a lot that we can that we can glean from these few verses here. I want you to hear again Peter's words in verse 3. Speaking of Jesus, he says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him. The good news that we can share this morning is that our supply is sufficient in Christ. That He has supplied to us everything we need for our life and for our life in Him. I, so often I, I have conversations with believers, with church members, with, 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 with good followers of Christ, but, but, but who have the misunderstanding that somehow they think there is something that's 
lacking or, or missing within their life to be all that they want to be in Christ. I just I, I don't I don't have enough faith to be able to to, to do that. I don't have you know uh, 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 enough love. I don't have great enough discipline. I don't have this or I don't have that. And, and and there are probably lots of places we can go in the New Testament, but this particular little passage just totally flies in the face of that misunderstanding that we have within our lives. Now, I'm not saying that every believer can do everything. I, that, that's not how God designed us. You know, He designed us with particular gifts and with per, particular uh, 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 natural bents and, 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 and abilities, and He calls us to use those, whatever they may be, in service to Him. But I also want to follow that quickly, that, that often... Often we use the phrase, well, you know, that's really not my gifting, as an excuse not to do something that we don't want to do or that we're afraid of. Here's a fact. If you read the passages in the New Testament that deal with our spiritual gifts, nearly every spiritual gift comes with an accompanying command. Let me give you a couple of examples. For example, there is a gift a spiritual gift of evangelism. Some people have just designed, have been designed by God in, in such a way that makes them natural at, at sharing their faith with people. People who are not people of faith. But some people just have that natural bent and that natural gifting. But all of us have been called to be witnesses for Christ and to share our faith. That's a command, a calling that is apart from the gifting. Let me give you one more. I can give you a whole list, but we're going to just we'll settle for two this morning. There is, in the New Testament, the reference several times to a gift of giving. Some people have this spiritual gift of giving. As I have seen and experienced that through, through my ministry, usually the people who have that spiritual gift of giving also have this strange spiritual gift of 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 acquiring or making. In other words, God has, has designed them and built them in such a way that, that they just seem to have a natural ability to do things that make money or bring resources into their life, but along with that, they have a gift for giving and sharing and supplying in, in, in very generous ways those things to, to the ministry. That is a spiritual gift, but God has called all of us to give. He's commanded us to be givers and to be generous and to be, you know, falling under the, the, the umbrella of the tithe. I mean, we could go on and on there. Nearly every spiritual gift comes with a command. So just because that's not my spiritual gift doesn't necessarily mean that I haven't been commanded to be involved in that thing. It may just not be the thing that I am best at. It may not be my primary outlet for ministry, but it doesn't mean that I'm excused from the commands of God. Now, having said all that, sometimes within the area of our spiritual gift, and many times in areas that maybe aren't our gift but are our commands, we we make excuses for why we don't do the things that we have been commanded or called to do in Scripture. And those excuses often fall under that idea of somehow I am lacking something. I, I'm, I'm not a good speaker, so you know the idea of 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 of, of teaching, you know, even even in, in a small part, the idea of speaking to, to 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 people in in any form is is something I'm uncomfortable with. That's not my spiritual gift, so I excuse myself from it. But but there's a calling and a command that goes along with that, and 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 we're called to rely upon the sufficiency of God's supply within our life. Noah, coming along as a senior and graduating from high school this last week, all of what he has experienced has recalled to my own memory a, a, a lot of experiences from, from my own senior year in high school because that was a, it was a pretty formative year in my life. I started the year absolutely certain and convinced that I was going to be a high school band director. 
By November, I had already applied. I'd been accepted to CMSU and the Instrumental Music Education Department. I knew professors there because I grew up in the town. And because of what I'm about to tell you, I don't know how it was that I thought that I could do that. <clears throat> but, but that was my plan. I had a plan. It was in place. The building blocks were all falling into place until January of, of my senior year. God, in, in, in an incredible and unquestionable and absolutely certain way, called me into ministry. Now, I was shy and quiet and backwards like you all have known Noah to be. He's growing out of that. But, but I, that, that was me. I, I stuttered. I still do. But I stuttered horribly. And the more nervous I was, the worse that I stuttered. You know, and some people, my mom especially, were so incredibly excited and proud when I expressed a you know, call in the ministry. And some other people were like, you're going to do what? <laughs> you're gonna, how are you going to do that? Uh, that? That that March, we already had on the schedule when I surrendered to ministry. Uh, we had a youth Sunday that, that was on the calendar. And uh, my pastor came to me the next week and said, you know, you said he's coming up. It's just like six weeks away. And I, it looks like you're going to preach. <laughs> really? That's going to be interesting. I, he was so helpful. You know, he sat down. He gave me some, some, some guidance as to how, how to go about writing a sermon. And I, I found a passage that meant a lot to me. And I, I took, I, you know, I still do most of my sermon work by, by hand. I do lots of stuff on the computer, but... It's just, I don't know, it's just something about writing pen, pen on paper. So I, I wrote this sermon bullet points, not as manuscript, but bullet points, out on 8.5 by 14 legal pad. I still got the legal pad and the tape, by the way, if you need proof of this. And I forget, but it was like seven or eight pages, 8.5 by 14. I was ready to go. I was set. And that morning came, and we went through the song service, and we had the offering, and I got up behind that great big pulpit at Grover Park Baptist Church. And I began to deliver my sermon, and then I finished delivering my sermon, and the beginning and the ending were only generously about seven and a half minutes apart. Most people today don't believe that, but it's true. But, but you know what? It was, it, it was, that, that, was, that was okay, but it, but it was good, and it was, a, it was a step, and it was a step in which I, I began to realize that you know, God can supply some things that I don't think I'm capable of. That our ministry is not a matter of, of what we are capable of. It's not a matter of our abilities. God doesn't call you. He's not looking for you to, to bring your abilities, but rather your availability to the game of ministry. He's looking for some people who will trust Him and follow Him wherever He leads and then allow Him to supply what they think they're missing because the truth of the matter is whenever we come to Christ and whenever the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us with the spiritual and natural giftings that He has already given to us and His incredible ability to work miraculously in our lives in ways that we don't expect, God has already given to us everything we need to be who He created us to be and to follow Him in ministry and whatever He calls us to do. Our timidity, our, our fear and trepidation in taking on new things is merely an obstacle that we need to not allow to become a stumbling block because it is an opportunity for God to prove His sufficiency, His power within our lives. Real quickly, some things. As God supplies all of the tools and materials we need to grow in life. First, we see here that, that Peter tells us that, that God not only provides us tools, but He provides us power tools. What guy doesn't like some power tools, right? Right? You know, this this week I uh, I had I have a sliding glass door, two of them actually in my house that that were broken, and they've been broken for a long time. And I've been begged and begged and begged and cajoled and all kinds of things, and I have put it off. Well, over the course of the last couple of weeks, with the graduation thing coming, I, I 
I fixed the upstairs one, and this week I, I repaired the downstairs one. Part of the problem was that you know th these doors are old, and you can't get the exact parts for the exact door, so you got to use a, a little bit of, of, of old-fashioned thinking outside the box, and you know you got to get some parts, and then you got to modify them a little bit. Ken, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, and part one of the things I had to do on one of them because the latch, the new latch just didn't fit quite the way the old one did, so I had to kind of cut some of the metal out of the edge of the door to create some extra space. And, you know, there are several ways to go about doing that. I was so glad I owned an angle grinder this week because I figured out pretty quickly that a hacksaw blade was going to take a month to get that job done, but a power tool can do what a hand tool can do when used properly in a fraction of the time. Power tools are incredible things. They allow us to, to accomplish tasks that might take us very long time. We might not be able to do it all, but suddenly we can do because we have power of a motor and electricity. Peter tells us here that, that we not only have everything that we need for life and godliness, but that it has been supplied by the divine power of God at work within us. It is His power that has provided for us what we need. So if we're, if we're concerned about our ability, we can let go of that concern because it's not about our power, but rather the power of God at work within us and through us that makes the real difference, that creates the life and brings about the godliness that He desires within us. He tells us that, that these are tools of skilled labor. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Here's a fact. You have tools, spiritual tools at your disposal that you don't even know yet. That time in your life is going to come when you're going to need that particular truth, that particular tool within your life in order to be what God desires for you to be, to do what He calls you to do. You, you, you may not even know you have it, or you may have it, you may have no idea what to do with it, but it's as we grow in our knowledge of Christ, as we grow in our knowledge of His Word, as we grow in our relationship and our dependence upon Him, that we learn at the proper time to use all the tools that He has already supplied for us. He's given them to us in His Word. He's given them to us through His Holy Spirit who dwells within us. And at the proper time, if we're following Him, if we are seeking and searching from Him what we need, He will show us how to use those things that have been there at our fingertips all along at the time when it is most needed. And then He gives us this beautiful guarantee Verse 4, through these, through His glory, His goodness, His power, through these He has given us His very great and precious promises that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desire. What an incredible statement. We, we fear our own inability because we're very aware of the limited nature of who we are as human beings walking in flesh on this earth. But the thing we forget is that at that moment that we come to faith in Christ, at the moment that the blood of the cross is applied to our lives, is that, at that moment that the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us, at that moment we are born again. Do you remember that phrase? We forget what it means. It doesn't just mean that we made a decision. It literally means that something happened that transformed us, that changed us from the inside out, and all of a sudden we are a new creature, a new creation, a new species. We have a new spiritual life that didn't exist before. Suddenly we, suddenly we, we participate in the divine nature that is that peace that we had forgotten existed of the of the image of God within us. And, and as we walk in the divine nature that is who we are in Christ, then we come to escape the corruption of the world. The corruption of the world. The, 
philosophies of the world are poison. And we don't have to look very far at all today to see what they are and to see how we are bombarded with them every single day. And what they bring at, at the moment seems to be some sort of peace through acceptance within the world, but what they ultimately bring is rottenness to our lives. And even as a believer, we can be plagued by the rottenness that comes through the philosophies and the corruption of the world if we allow worldly thinking to dominate our minds and we allow worldly action to dominate our character. We have to continually combat this corruption, this rottenness that comes from thinking as the world thinks, not thinking as a person who participates in the divine nature. In my house, I've got a piece of soffit right above my front door, right where everybody who comes to the house sees it, that isn't very well protected from the weather. And over time, the freeze board has, has uh, well, it split and came off of the nails, and, and, and the two by six that supports all that back behind is now exposed, and it's a mess. Now, I have it on high on my priority list over the next few weeks to figure out how to get into that and tear that out and replace it and fix it. Partly because it looks horrible. One. Two, because right now there is an opening through that freeze board into my attic and I've had a nice nest of birds that have been tweeting right above my bed for the last couple of months and I don't want to repeat that. But most importantly, I, want to re I need to replace it because it's exposed to the weather and it's already rotten. And I know that if I allow that rot to stay, it will cause further rot into my house and the damage is only going to continue. It's only when I take time to take out the corruption, to take out the corrupted parts, to take out the rottenness and re replace it with what is good that it'll be safe and secure and sealed up. And, and that's kind of how our lives are. We... we if we're not careful, we can so easily begin <clears throat> to, to fall into the thinking of the world around us because we're surrounded by it all the time. We see it on television. We see it on the Internet. We read it in newspapers, if you still read those things. Wherever you get your information, it's, it's there. <clears throat> and it's so easy to, to begin to, to, to think in those ways because we don't take time to filter out the corruption of the world around us. I am dumbfounded in the change of the philosophy and the thinking of our culture in my lifetime, from the time I was a teenager in the 80s till now. It's like a different world. Why? Because, because those philosophies, because that worldly thinking, because that that unchristian, unrighteous thinking has been allowed to fester and it has spread and it has become a rotten corruption throughout our culture. And it threatens the minds and it threatens the ministries of believers if we don't take time to allow God to cut away the rottenness, the corruption that comes from that worldly thinking, those worldly messages, and remind ourselves that we are children of God. That we are children of righteousness. That we're not perfect and sinless in ourselves, but that we've been given an incredible gift of the sinlessness of Christ. That we have been called to obedience to God. That we've been given a new spiritual, eternal life that is different from the world around us. And if we can't communicate in a way that the world will understand and accept, it's not because there is a failing on our part, and it's certainly not because there is a failing on God's part, but it's because we live in a world that has decided to reject the truth of God for the rottenness of its own wisdom and philosophy. God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. It's frustrating sometimes to know that we can't turn around and change the whole world around us. Even following God in the very best that we can and allowing Him to work as only He can within our lives, much of the world around us 
is going to go its own way. Jesus said that clearly. He said in the Sermon on the Mount, He said, Wide is the gate and broad is the path that leads to destruction, and many are those who travel by it. And narrow is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few are those who follow it. It's sad and it, and it breaks our hearts that many, many, many around us will never come to that place of faith. But we need not to allow that to become defeat on our part because we have experienced victory. And we're going to continue to, to, to call and to witness and to minister and to do all that God has called us to do. And we're going to depend upon His power and we're going to allow God to do what only God can, can do. And we're going to rest in knowing that we have done what we could do with the tools that He has given to us. With that thought in our minds this morning, I'm going to invite you to stand with me. We're going to pray together. Gary's going to come and lead us in our invitation hymn. As perhaps the Lord may speak to your heart this morning, we invite you to follow Him wherever He leads you today. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank You so much for Your incredible supply in our lives, that You have given us everything we need to be who You desire us to be, to be what You need us to be. And Lord, that's not something that we that we boast or brag about within our own lives. We recognize that that is purely a work of Your power through the incredible knowledge of You and Your grace. And so Lord, I pray that You would help us humbly but confidently to, to, to walk in You knowing that whatever You call us to do, You've supplied all that we need. You've given us tools that we don't even know yet, that we don't even yet understand how to use, but but Lord, as we grow in our knowledge of You and, and, and in trusting You, You show us how to use the, the, the truths and the tools You've already given us to be who You call for us to be. Lord, help us to filter out the corruption of the world around us that, that leads to death and that leads many believers to lives of ineffectiveness. Lord, help us to walk in the divine nature that is ours through the work of Christ on the cross. That we might be examples and that we might proclaim to the world around us the wonder of Your love and grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Here you this is The invitation is, My Jesus, I love Thee. My Jesus, I love thee, thine love thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior,
I am so glad that we got to worship together this morning. And I pray God be with you in the week that goes ahead, lies ahead, and He'll keep you safe. And look forward to being back together to worship with you again next week uh, as we uh, as we return. As we close this morning, I'm going to ask Brother Don Laughlin, would you lead us in a closing?